statistical mathematical fact. Never has been down, has broken every single record. There is no asset that has come close. It's the only thing in the industry that was not touched, that was not hacked, and it never fails doing what it promised in 2009. It's never What's failed. What's the best performing asset the world has ever seen? And you'll find out that Welcome. it's Bitcoin. Welcome Bitcoiners. Welcome traders. Welcome followers. Welcome supporters. Welcome haters. I know you're out there. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to another live space with Oliver Velez. Of course, my name is Oliver Velez and I am your Bitcoiner for life. Well, you know, that's what I'm actually trying to be. I'm trying to be that voice in the wilderness, that voice in the darkness that helps you stay on track, that helps you understand that Bitcoin is the most unique, most opportunistic innovation that has ever happened to the human race. I've taken upon myself to do my best to convince you that this is so special that it should almost never be let go. That this is so unique for the human experience that we should be fortunate to consider ourselves alive at this particular point in history. I'm hoping to convince you that this is not something that you trade, but I'm hoping to convince you that this is something that you trade everything else for. And so, it's for this reason that uh, I'm trying to be your Bitcoiner for life. So anyway, welcome guys. Welcome to another talk. The last talk we had yesterday I thought was very fascinating. Guys, if you did not catch our last talk yesterday, I strongly encourage, I'm asking you, I'm in fact begging you to actually take in that last talk. You can do so on my podcast called Bitcoin Unleashed. Bitcoin Unleashed is where I post all of my talks regarding Bitcoin. So if you want to see any of the past ones, um, please refer to my podcast, Bitcoin Unleashed. It is on every podcasting medium you can think of. So pick the poison of your choice. I actually like the uh, Fountain app because the Fountain app allows us to earn free Satoshis while we listen to podcasts and also the Fountain app gives me the ability to take some of my long-term format talks and create smaller clips, smaller, more digestible clips out of them. So, for instance, I, I believe I have something like um, 54 different episodes on Bitcoin Unleashed, but there's well over, I believe it's 100 clips or something like that. Um, that range anywhere from four minutes long to eight minutes long and things of that nature. So you can um, do the deep dive there on any of our past talks. But it was the one yesterday that I really feel hit home in a very, very powerful way. And it's something that I'm hoping that I'm in fact begging that the majority of you actually take in. All right. So without any further ado, let's talk about the topic today. I wanted to talk about Bitcoin mining and how I believe that Bitcoin miners are our, they serve as the ability for us to peer into the future of Bitcoin, in my opinion. I believe that the Bitcoin hash rate, which is, um, you know, inextricably intertwined with the topic of Bitcoin mining, the Bitcoin hash rate is really the only metric we need focus on, we need give our attention to. I believe that the Bitcoin hash rate as a metric is more important than the US dollar denominated price of Bitcoin. You see, the unit that we use to view Bitcoin is not as important as the item itself because there are a variety of different units or glasses through which we can, or lenses through which we can view one Bitcoin. All right, so one Bitcoin through the lens or the glasses, if you will, through the view of the U.S. dollar is different from the view from the Turkish lira. 
And one Bitcoin looks differently when you look at it through the Argentinian peso or the Japanese yen or the euro. So there are these different glasses through which or these different lenses through which we can view what one Bitcoin is. But those views are very different and are really not connected in any way to the item that is that's being viewed bitcoin but the metric that gives us the purest unadulterated view of what bitcoin is and what its future is likely to be is the bitcoin hash rate and that's what i want to talk to about to talk to you about today now i will have to say a few things up front number one all right um I am a Bitcoin miner. All right. I'm a Bitcoin miner as of 2020. I've, I've, I'm relatively new to the Bitcoin mining space. I started Bitcoin mining in Latin America in 2021. So I am a Bitcoin miner. I speak with only a relatively small period of experience Bitcoin mining. So I still do not consider myself an expert. I have a team whom I pay to actually handle all the details of my mining operation. And so I am not hands-on. I am not on the ground. I visit. I have a cursory understanding and overview of the process, of the things involved, the technology, the machines, the energy consumption, usage, and so forth and so on. But am I truly a Bitcoin expert? Absolutely not. But I am a Bitcoin miner. So I wanted to get that out of the way first. Um, and so with that, I, I'd like to delve in to why Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin's hash rate is the only metric and the only key that we really need and I truly believe that this one metric, the Bitcoin hash rate and Bitcoin miners in particular, how they will help us to basically sidestep all the noise out there in the industry. So let me delve right in. I think it's important for those who are listening to me to understand my background to a certain extent. I've been in the traditional finance space for the last 43 years. I placed my first trade in the markets, in the equity markets in March of 1981. I landed my first professional trading job on Wall Street in December of 1986. And I've done nothing with my life other than play financial markets. I have spent my career scouring the earth for the best opportunities that are available. And I have literally traded the markets virtually every single day, working day of my life for the past 43 years. But what I want to tell you about this is something connected more to the beginning, my foray into this professional trading space. When I was brought on as a professional trader, I learned how important it was back in the mid to, to late 1980s, what the insiders were doing. And I learned how important it was for us as traders to keep our finger on the pulse of what the insiders of certain corporations, publicly traded corporations were doing. And so when you're working on Wall Street, you get assigned a set number of companies to focus on with your trading. You're given a specific dollar amount. You're giving a risk profile or parameters. You can't have this, um, you can't go past this exposure on any given day. You can only trade these specific symbols on any given day. Um, you can't, you have a maximum drawdown per day, per week, per month, so forth and so on. But we, it was our responsibility with the companies that we were assigned to, to trade, 
we had to keep our finger on the pulse of what the insiders of those organizations we were trading were doing. We had subscriptions to all of the services that gave us a head start on what the insider buying and selling activity were amongst the, the high level executives for the organizations that we traded. And so these services, right? We're in business to provide executives inside executive buys and sells before the general public knew what they were. And we subscribe to all of these services. And this gave anyone with access to this information an edge. Now, let me add a little bit more flesh, and I promise I'm going to show you how this ties into our talk today. Now, what you have to understand about monitoring the inside moves of executives, which actually, whom, whom, whom act, who actually have to report all of their purchases or sales of the stock that they, of the company that they work for, all right? We wouldn't focus on every single employee doing this, but you're, re you're basically your board members and your real top high-level management you wanted to keep an eye on. Now, I want you to understand this. While their selling is very important, you'd always want to know when a top insider is starting to dump his own shares. But there are myriad reasons why you might sell. This executive might have two twin twin boys graduating from high school about to go to Harvard, okay? Um, and he's selling some shares for that. It might be to buy, you know, a 35-bedroom mansion in Malibu right off the ocean in California. So the point, or, or buy a private jet, the point I'm saying is that you can't tie a cell to a specific purpose. It can be one of millions of reasons that's not, and, the, and, and those reasons don't necessarily mean that the executive is sour on his own company. But when you have a top insider or board member constantly buying their own stock, OMG. You see, because a purchase by an insider is only for one reason, a sale by an insider can be for myriad reasons. But you only buy for one and one reason only. And so it was the insider buys that we focused on the most. And we would start accumulating positions in stocks where we saw the top three executives all at the same time pick up the rate of their buying of their own stock. Now, why is this important? It gave us such an edge. We made millions of dollars by, by having an edge on this information before others did, before the general public did. We would pay people to get this information before the, it was, it was, they were obligated to report it to the general public. And it gave us this incredible edge. Now, why is this insider buying um, so meaningful? It's meaningful because there is no one more informed than an insider. There is no one on earth they can tell you more about the goings-on than your top 10 people in an organization. They know more than any reporter will ever know. They know more than any journalist will ever know. They know more than any analyst will ever know. They know more than anyone on planet Earth about what's going on, what deals are in the works, what the future outlook is. And so when those insiders start placing bets with their own money on their own stock, and they're not obligated to do that, then you know that's for one reason 
and one reason only, they know something. And their accuracy is extraordinarily high. This is not a hit or miss thing, guys. Their accuracy is extraordinarily high. Now, this edge that we used to take advantage of in the mid to late 1980s, this edge kept getting smaller and smaller, and the internet basically eliminated that arbitrage that we basically had because we had a time arbitrage where in the pre-internet world, this insider information, it took a while for it to seep through the general public, the general public psyche. It would take weeks. But as the internet became more and more adopted and used on Wall Street, the space of time between when an insider bought and when the general public knew it kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so that arbitrage got squeezed out of the market. That, that arbitrage opportunity was eliminated. Most spreads are eliminated through adoption and technical innovation, all right? And so the accuracy of this was so high, and it still continues to be high. It's just that it's very difficult to get advance notice of it unless you're one of the insiders yourselves, yourself. All right, so we've got that established, okay? that insiders know more than anyone else. Now, in Bitcoin, let's leave the stock market for, now, for the moment. In Bitcoin, who are your insiders? Is it Oliver Velez? No. Who are your insiders? Is it the exchanges? Mm -hmm. No. A lot of people think the, the exchanges are insiders, the Binances of the world, the coin, coin, the coin bases of the world. No, they're not. To use Wall Street terms, they would be more like middle tier management. When I'm talking about insiders or the people that are truly at the top, of the food chain, the ones that know way more than the exchanges know themselves. These, ladies and gentlemen, are your Bitcoin miners. The Bitcoin miners are the insiders of Bitcoin. They know more about the Bitcoin network than anybody else on earth. They know how it functions, how it works. They know its idiosyncrasies. They know its strengths. They know its weaknesses. They know everything about the mining process. They know all about, they know more about the cycles than anyone else on planet Earth. They know about the flow into Bitcoin, the flow out of Bitcoin. They're at the spigot, guys. They're at the spigot. They're the ones, they're First in line at the Bitcoin spigot, they are the closest. They are the ones in the know. The details with which they have to stay on top of, the metrics that they have to constantly watch, the balancing act between energy cost and supply and demand in the market and things of this nature, this, where we are in the cycle of Bit and, and Bitcoin's four-year cycle, the things that they have to monitor, and at times the razor-thin difference between a profit and a loss makes them have to be experts of the highest order. You can't get more insider than a Bitcoiner, than a Bitcoin miner. You can't be more inside. Now, I'm not talking about your home miners and the people who bought a, 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 a heater to mine Bitcoin in the wintertime or some guy who's, you know, annoying his family to death because he's got two ASICs miners in the basement. 
I'm talking about your more sizable institutional style Bitcoin miners today. These are your true insiders. And as I told you, if the insiders on Wall Street, high-level executives for these corporations gave you an edge in what was going on with the company and the potential future price of the particular stock, then the Bitcoin miners do the very same thing for Bitcoin. You see, guys, Bitcoin miners are what's lar what is responsible for the number one metric in the entire Bitcoin ecosystem. And that is Bitcoin's hash rate. Now guys, listen, Bitcoin works on a pr proof of work protocol. It uses SHA-256 SHA hash mechanism. And what a hash is predominantly is to, I don't know, for the sake of simplicity, I'll just say that a hash is a compute is a is a computation. A hash is a is a is a digital computation, a com a computer computation, a computation. All right. Bitcoin's hash rate today, which is produced by the computations by all the miners combined. Bitcoin's hash rate today stands very close to 600 exahashes, not 600 hashes. A hash is one computation. 600 exahashes. Now, let, let me give you a small sense of what an exahash is. Not a hash, but an exahash. One exahash per second is equal to one, get this number guys, one exahash per second is equal to one quintillion hashes per second. One quintillion hashes per second. One quintillion computations per second. Do you know, just in saying that sentence, how many quintillion? Quintillion exahashes were, went off in the network. Now, it's very difficult for human beings to wrap their minds around exponential numbers. But think of a trillion being small compared to a quintillion. We're talking about not one exahash, which is one quintillion computations per second. We're talking about 600 quintillions, 600 exahashes. Now, to put this in perspective, so 600, this is an incredibly high hash rate. It indicates that Bitcoin is extraordinarily powerful as a network. And it's capable of performing vast numbers of calculations in a short period of time. Now, this hash rate makes Bitcoin the most secure network that has ever existed in the history of human mankind. There is nothing even close. So one way to look at the hash rate is that the higher the hash rate, the more secure Bitcoin is. Bitcoin in its simplest form is nothing more than a vault, a vault into which you and I can store our value. We can store our wealth. We can store the fruits of our labor and be sure that it's being stored in the most secure vault the world has ever had access to. And this security, this hash rate, the higher the hash rate, the higher the security. This security continues to grow. Now, 
you saw the chart that I posted today of Bitcoin's hash rate. This hash rate, this chart I showed you from the beginning of Bitcoin's life, it's done nothing but go up. It's done nothing but make new high after new high after new high. Irrespective of what Bitcoin's price, underlying USD price was doing, Bitcoin's hash rate has made new high after new high after new high. And when you look at that chart, traders, Bitcoiners, ladies and gentlemen, supporters, haters, when you look at that chart, you see clearly that this thing is rising at a rate like nothing else in this entire world is rising. There is nothing outpacing the growth rate of Bitcoin's hash rate. There is nothing on earth that is growing that steadily, that with that velocity, with that momentum, with that consistency over the past 15 years. The Bitcoin hash rate has even outstripped Bitcoin's USD price itself. And this is the main metric. This is as if you are look, peering into Bitcoin's body and seeing its vertebrae. This is the essence of Bitcoin security. This is the essence of Bitcoin's um, strength. It's the essence of Bitcoin's power. It's the essence of Bitcoin's superiority because nothing on earth is as strong, powerful, and secure as this network. If you were to compare this hash rate to any other proof of work protocol in the cryptocurrency space, it's just like a freaking joke. There's nothing close. Now, what does a rising hash rate mean? Why is this metric continuously making new high after new high after new high? Because more and more computing power is joining the network. And this is very important to know. More miners, miners are dedicating more resources to the network. New, pe new people that want to join the mining community are putting more resources into the network. Now, this is at the crux of what I want to explain to you today. If miners are our insiders and we know that the, 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 that the number one activity that you want to keep track of from an insider are their purchases, well, miners don't necessarily purchase Bitcoin. So how do we monitor the purchases from, an, from the miner? from a miner, if a miner doesn't necessarily purchase Bitcoin, some of them do, but if that's not their function to purchase Bitcoin, but yet we know that the most important activity from an insider are their purchases, not their sales, sells, then what exactly is a purchase of a miner? It's expansion. What exactly is a buy from a miner? It's a new mining plant. It's more ASICs mining machines. It's more hash power added to their operation. And so when you see that hash rate making new high after new high, what you're looking at is a metric that's telling you that the insiders are buying. Do you understand the enormity of this? Do you understand the importance of this? Do you understand that this is like going all the way back to the night in the mid 1980s and getting advanced notice of insiders buying their own stock? This metric gives us the inside track, the inside view of what the insiders, the ones that are most knowledgeable, the ones that will know more than you and I will ever know in a million years about the Bitcoin network. Why are they buying? Why are they expanding? Why are they dedicating resources that will pay off three, four, five, six years in the future? You see, guys, when you build a new mining operation, it might take a 
billion dollars for you to build that operation. It might take you 2.5 to three years before that operation goes live. Why are these miners expanding today? Let me give you just a few, a few examples of this. Marathon Digital is has, I believe it's taken out core scientific to become the world's largest Bitcoin miner. All right. They recently went into partnership with, if I'm not mistaken here, they went into partnership with Abu Dhabi's Zero Two organization for to build the Middle East's first large-scale immersion cooling Bitcoin mining operation. The Middle East is stepping into the Bitcoin mining space with power and force. They are, they, are, they are coming together to build a mining operation that is so big that it's going to require more than a billion dollars to bring it online. It's not going to go live until two years from now. And these are the insiders. They're not dumb people. What does this purchase that can't even start, what is this insider buy telling you that it even, especially since the buy can't start paying off for you for two to three years out? What does billions of dollars being bought today insider buying today telling you about two, three, four, five years going forward. These are not people that just throw billions of dollars in the air. Do you understand this? These are insiders. They know more about Bitcoin. They know more about the Bitcoin network. They know more about how it operates. Everything than you and I will ever know in a million years. The insiders are buying. Tether, Tether, the largest stablecoin operator in the world of USDT, right? Why have they begin? Why have they begun to get into the mining space? This is an organization that is cash rich. They literally buy Bitcoin every single month of their lives, and they just committed half a billion dollar investment in South America to build out Bitcoin mining plants in South America, half a billion. These plants won't go online for years, but the investment has to be made today. What is this telling you about the future? You can't get a better metric than insider buying. I learned this on Wall Street all the way back in the 1980s. These Bitcoin miners, these are our insiders today. And you can take a look at what all the Bitcoin miners are doing by simply looking at one metric, Bitcoin's hash rate. Now, if you're listening to me live, I want you to go to that chart. I want you to go to it now. Take a look at it right now. Go to the Bitcoin hash rate chart. I want you to stare at it. And then I want you to honor it. Honor it with a moment of silence. Now look at how powerful its ascent is. Look at how uninterrupted it is. Look at how it's a thing of beauty. You got it? You took it all in? You got the picture seared in your mind? Now, that picture is telling you what the future of Bitcoin's price will even do. I am of the camp that the Bitcoin hash rate leads price. I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for that. I know I'm going to get all the so-called Bitcoin mining experts coming out of the woodwork. But Oliver, you're wrong. 
Bitcoin hash rate doesn't lead price because of this and because of that. That, 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 that. Bullshit. I don't believe it. Bitcoin hash rate leads price. All right. That is what I believe. And I'm sticking to it. In my study of going to the going back in the past, Bitcoin's hash rate has always been at a new high before Bitcoin moves to a new high. That has been the case every single bear market in Bitcoin's history. Bitcoin has a bear market one out of every four years. One out of every four years. After that bear market drop in that one year, Bitcoin hash rate moves to a new high first. Bitcoin's USD dollar price moves to a new high after every single time. As far as I'm concerned, Bitcoin's hash rate, Bitcoin's hash rate leads the price. And if you look at this chart, you've got an advanced indication of where we're going, buddy. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Thank you very much, Petri, for posting that. I appreciate that. You, in one metric, traders, in one metric, it's amazing. What we have is the ability to peer into the future by knowing what the insiders are doing. We have the ability to peer into the future and know where the price is likely to go. With this one metric, we are given the ability to see as living proof that the Bitcoin network is becoming more and more decentralized because the growth of this metric is not just one miner. It's miners joining from all over the world. With this one metric, we can be assured that there is massive adoption going on in Bitcoin because a rising hash rate can mean nothing else but more adoption. What better adoption does a network need than minor adoption? A network... The, the most important adoption of a digital network is its miners. It's not the, the $5 DCA or dollar cost averager every week. That's not the adoption that's the most important. I'm not saying it's zero importance, but that's not the most important adoption for the Bitcoin network, the most important adoption is minor adoption. And look at that chart again. That's what you see. That's the real adoption. That's the adoption that really matters. This adoption makes for the most, the strongest network to ever come into existence. This type of adoption is what creates the most secure network that humans have ever had access to. And it's this type of adoption that guarantees future price appreciation and growing decentralization of the network. In one metric, ladies and gentlemen, in one metric, we have it all. And so whenever you are being pulled away by the FUD in the mainstream media, fear, uncertainty, doubt, whenever these crypto bros and so-called trading experts tell you this and that in their doom and gloom way about Bitcoin. I want you to pull this chart up and say F you to all of that. This chart tells the truth. This chart reveals all the Bitcoin hash rate. This chart cuts through, captures, and clarifies the, the essence of the asset that has come to free us all from the BS, the nonsense that goes on in the traditional world. 
the traditional financial world. And so this is it. Now, I would actually love to to see what you have to say about this. I would love it. You know, every time I try to see if you've asked me questions, I actually see more questions when I come off of the live space. So it's really weird. That's why I don't think that this the space is technology quite yet is fully ready for prime time because I only see limited when I'm live, but I see all of them the moment I disconnect. So that's a bit unfair. But anyway. All right, Muhammad's asking, um, Oliver Boss, the past 24 hours, more than 400,000 BTC uh, changed hands. Uh, what do you make of this huge transfer of coins in a single day? Um, you know, I want to go in a certain direction as I answer this question. And I want to add a little bit of education to my response. Many of my traders are some of the new ones that come on board or even some of the ones that follow me on YouTube or what have you, they get surprised that today I don't place a lot of importance on the metric called volume. That volume, when I first started as a trader, was extraordinarily important. And it is because all the volume was transparent and it was real. Um, today, most volume is hidden. This was not the case when I first started. As far as the equity markets are concerned, there are dark pools of liquidity that give institutions the ability to hide their transactions or postpone when they have to reveal them. There are gray pools of liquidity that do it partially and not entirely. So volume today, in the equity markets at least, are not as authentic as they used to be. And most volume is not seen by the general public. So volume today as a metric is less important than it used to be. But it surprises me to no end, even to this very day, how many regular people that are market participants in one form or another still have no concept that every single sell is also a buy. And every single buy is also a sell. Like, the general public tends to forget that. The general public tends to lose sight of the fact that you can't have an imbalance between buying and selling. There is no such thing as there's more buying than selling. How? How can there ever be more buying than selling? They can't. Oh, there's more selling. The sellers are selling more than the buyers are buying. How? How is that possible? These are false narratives. You can't ever have an imbalance between buying and selling. What you can have an imbalance between is supply and demand. But the buy, every buy is also a sell, and every sell is also a buy. So when we, when you say, what does the changing of hands of 400,000 Bitcoin is, obviously, someone let go, a bunch of people let go of Bitcoin collectively uh, um, for 400 of them, 400,000 400, of them, and someone else took over the ownership of 400,000 Bitcoin. And it's simple. And a lot of people say, well, Oliver, how can so much buying be going on and selling going on? And there's no movement of the price. And it's largely because there are several things that contribute to massive volume can go off. And there's no price movement because buying and selling is equal. It's not the transactional volume that moves anything because a single buy is equivalent to a single sell and vice versa. So because both forces are equal, there is no price movement pressure. What 
moves price is the ultimate removal of supply at a certain price level or the increase of supply at a certain price level. So let me give you an example. If we're at $41,000 of Bitcoin and there are buys going off at 41, all right? So we're right at 41 and there are buys going off, but for every buy, there's also someone selling to that buyer at 41, all right? So every buy is met by, has to be met by someone willing to sell at 41. And the buyers keep buying and the sellers keep selling. And then the buyers all of a sudden want to buy at 41, but there are there's no more seller at 41 anymore. So now it's like, well, wait, we, we want 41, but no, 41 supply has dried up. There are no other market participants willing to let go of their Bitcoin at 41. So the only thing you can do is look higher and say, where is the next seller sitting at? Oh, the next seller is sitting at 41 to 41,200. So you either have to reach up to start buying at 41, 41,200, or you stay there with no Bitcoin. And so if the buyers start reaching up and start taking out the supply of the sellers at 41,200, every buy there is met by an equal sell. There will be no price movement. Every buy and sell is the same. Every buy and sell is the same. The only thing that can lift it from 41,200 is that all of the sellers willing to sell at 41,200 have disappeared, have gone, have been absorbed by the buyers, and there is not a single player left willing to give up their Bitcoin at 41,200. Now you have to look higher. And so it's not the transactions. The transactions might lead to a certain price being wiped out in terms of its supply or, or uh, in terms of its supply, but that leads to it. But you can have a whole lot of trading go on at a specific price, and there's no price movement which tells you for every buy, there's a sell, and no side is weakening right now. The buyers keep buying, the sellers keep selling at the same price, and therefore there is price stability. And so this idea that volume, right, um, drives price movement is, is, it's not entirely wrong, but it's kind of false because it's the result of what that volume does. If that volume doesn't wipe out one side or the other, then you will have price stability as long as that happens. All right. And so one way, Muhammad, to I'm sorry I'm being so winded with this, but I thought it would be beneficial for me to go into this whole thing because I see how many people get this wrong even here, all right? But a very simple way to look at volume is simply as a change of ownership. Whenever I see a huge volume spike, the price doesn't have to move. What I know occurred was that a change of ownership of the underlying item occurred. So what does this change of ownership mean? It means that that big volume spike meant that there was a lot of what? A lot of buying. But in order to have a lot of buying, someone has to do what? Sell. So there was a lot of buying and a lot of selling. And so the buyers at this price are brand new buyers. And the sellers at this price are now gone. That's what a volume surge should tell you, that the underlying asset has new buyers, new owners. And why does new owners mean something? New owners don't have a negative attitude like older owners might have. They are not tainted by the past. They're brand new. They are less willing to let go of the underlying asset if there's some short-term price decline because they're brand new to the asset. 
they're brand new buyers. So that's what that's the importance of a volume surge that the that the ownership of the underlying item has changed and that the buyers or the holders of the asset are brand new, fresh. They're not tainted by a past. It's a brand new relationship. And that's usually bullish. All right. I see nine comments here, but I don't see the comments. That's the issue here. Just give me a moment. Let me see if I can get more of your comments here. All right. Um, Federico is saying, I have heard that as a miner, it is important to know when to turn off your machines, sell them, and then buy new ones once every cycle uh, to maximize profit. Can you please talk about this? Well, again, I, I will preface what I'm about to say regarding that question is I still, even though I am a Bitcoin miner, I still don't, don't consider myself a true expert on the topic, but I am learning all the time. And I will tell you this, that there is a market for just flipping Bitcoin miners, accumulating them at the right time during, during the time in the Bitcoin cycle where they sell at deep discounts, and not unboxing the miners, not unwrapping the miners, keeping them wrapped, not using them, and then flipping them in the part of the cycle where they sell for huge premiums. Now, I've learned this through my own experience in mining because I had to deal with such a backlog in, 20, in early 2021 due to the uh, supply chain being all backed up because of, you know, because of C-19. I had this big order that, was just taking forever for miners. And I kept adding to it because the time or delay kept getting longer. To make a long story short, I overbought miners. When they started coming in, they started coming in like, oh my God, I've got all of these miners. And I didn't, I literally bought more than the space that I had to mine. And so I stacked the miners up that I could not use. And, be, and, and basically, these miners, the prices of these untouched miners fluctuated. I watched the fluctuation in these prices and realize that there is actually, for a miner, a side business, a side hustle, flipping, buying Bitcoin miners and flipping them as well. So I added it to my business model. I added it to my Bitcoin business model, flipping Bitcoin miners. And so during this downward drop in the, 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 the Bitcoin market, there was a point where miners were selling for practically zero. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I scooped up a whole bunch of miners and... The price increase from those purchases have actually outperformed Bitcoin. But it only happens during certain parts of the whole of the four year Bitcoin cycle. And so I I I I I answer Federico's question partially with that personal experience of mine to say yes, part of knowing when to stack up on miners is important. It's one of many different metrics that Bitcoin miners have to keep their, their finger on the pulse of. Now, I have many, I have fewer metrics to keep track of than a big giant Bitcoin miner. I'm in Latin America. Energy is practically free where I mine. So I don't have a lot of the complexities that other miners have to balance out. You know, they're, these miners are, are, are making deals with the grid, purchasing energy in advance for the future and 
They've got experts that basically just go around the country um, to make deals with various parts of the 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 electric grid here and there and i'm not into mining at that particular level and so this is one of the reasons why i want it to be clear that while i'm a bitcoin miner i'm a very simplistic almost one dimensional one well two dimensional ones i found a way to make money with Bitcoin miners themselves, and I've found a money, obviously, to print money by mining Bitcoin with very low to almost zero energy costs. And so my operation is a lot simple. And as a result of it being a lot, lot, sim lot more simple, I don't have the level of expertise on all the other metrics that some of your bigger miners might have. All right. But yes, um, many of the other miners, Federico, while I don't have to deal with that, they have to worry about when to turn off their machines when it's not as profitable to mine, which will take hash power away from the overall network. Right. And then they'll have to know when to step it up, which will add hash power to the network. When to buy the miners, when to sell older miners to get newer miners, all of that's part of the game. So yes, Bitcoin community, uh, Deutschland says, no question, Oliver, but appreciate your talks very much. Listen, I appreciate you being a listener. I appreciate you being here, um, truly, truly. It's truly an honor, guys. I feel very honor, honored and privileged that anybody would want to listen to me. Uh, as I mentioned on many occasion, I. I still consider myself a Bitcoin baby. I have, um, over the past three and a half years, almost four years, I have studied Bitcoin, delved into Bitcoin, gone down the rabbit hole every single day of my life for three and a half years. I continue to do so. The deeper I go down this hole, the, the shallower I realize I am in the hole. It's a never-ending pit. And these are the things that I actually have always enjoyed. One of the things is the fact that there is no end to it. My father used to tell me, Oliver, for Christ's sakes, will you finish something? He used to tell me all the time, you never finish anything, Oliver. We bought you a hockey stick two weeks ago. Where's the hockey stick? Stick? Where is it? Under your bed somewhere? You probably don't even know. You can't even find it. And, and the skateboard we bought a month ago, where's the skateboard? Your friend had it. I saw your friend riding the skateboard down the street. You don't even have it anymore. And what about the skates we bought? You want it to go from a skateboard to skates, all right? Because you want it to play hockey on the skates. Well, you can't find the hockey stick. Your skateboard ha is, is with your friend. And the skates, God knows where those things are. <laughs> he used to say, you never finish anything. And it was true because I always quickly got bored with many things. And the only thing that came into my life that I did not get bored with was trading. Trading the markets for me captivated me because I realized quite quickly that this is a journey into the self. This is not about beating the market. This is about, this is not about mastering the market. This is about mastering you. This is about you becoming disciplined. This is about you getting to the place where you can do what you promise yourself you can do. You can keep your word. You can become more disciplined. You can become a man or woman of your word. You can do what you set out to do. You can follow your plan. This is not about finding opportunity. This is about you becoming the opportunity. So trading for me began, began to be this journey into the self. How many people in life really, truly master themselves? Because in order to master markets, before you have any chance of mastering the markets outside of you, you have to master yourself. And so trading grabbed me in a way that nothing else grabbed me because it was about self-mastery. And self-mastery, which I believe is the main reason we're here on this planet, is to discover who thyself, who yourself is, 
know thyself is the ancient inscription, right? That this is a lifelong process of self-discovery. And so trading for me is really a discovering of the self. It is the knowing of the self. It is becoming a better version of yourself and taking that better version into the market. And people think they can stay the same version of themselves, take their lack of discipline, take their false ideas, their erroneous belief systems, and bring all of that garbage to the market and produce profits. It doesn't work that way. You have to first change yourself. You have to become a better you, and then you take the better you into the market and you get better results. So it first starts with you. It doesn't start with the market. This is how the market gripped me. Well, the second thing to come into my life to grip me this way was Bitcoin. And I realized it's something that you can't really ever master. It's something that does not have a bottom to its rabbit hole. There is no finishing. There is no getting to the place where you get bored with it. And I absolutely love this. I love that. Some people are depressed by the fact that the horizon continues to grow. Do you understand? The horizon continues to get pushed further and further. You think you know something about Bitcoin, you get to that place, you see the end of your knowledge, and then boom, the, the horizon is now a million miles in front of you again. And some people get depressed that there's this, this lack of sense of completion to them. They feel as though, I, I, I feel like I'm never going to get this. And this is something that I absolutely love because it's the only way I won't get bored with something, that there is no end to it, that I will always be able to grow with Bitcoin. I will always be able to learn something new. I will always be able to know more. Bitcoin touches so many corners of our lives that it's virtually impossible. If we spend every waking hour of our entire lives studying, looking into Bitcoin, investigating, we wouldn't even be scratching the surface. And it is that that I love about Bitcoin. I'll never be bored, Dad. I'll never put this under the bed, Dad. I'll never hand this off to a friend, Dad. I found that thing that I will be with for the rest of my life, trading and Bitcoin. Nuolo is asking, Oliver, uh, wondering your opinion on the idea that miners are a central point of failure that if the government cracks down on Bitcoin, that the mining space is where they can cause issues for the network since mining is part of the physical realm. Um, this is a very, very good question, an intelligent question, and I appreciate it to no end, Nuolo. Thank you. So there is this popular notion that mining is Bitcoins, the mining industry, if you will, is Bitcoin's Achilles heel, that it is its weak spot because it is so tied to the physical world, as Nuolo says, and can be subject to government or nation state attacks. And this is true to a certain extent, because all we have to do is look back to May of 2021, to the time when China, the nation state, China, banned Bitcoin mining, and the hash rate took a better than 50% hit. And when you hit Bitcoin's hash rate, you're hitting its vertebrae. You're hitting the very essence of what Bitcoin is, as we discussed earlier in our talk. And so this was a big blow to the, to the hash rate. But what, why this event is so incredibly important for us to be aware of is because it shows that Bitcoin is a self-healing mechanism. That while you might be able to temporarily set it back, you might be able to temporarily bruise it through its Achilles heel. And it is, to a certain extent, its Achilles heel. China proved that to us. But what Bitcoin also proved is that, okay, you got a shot in on me. Just give me a little bit of time and I'll be back. I can't do my, uh, I can't do a very good Arnold Schwarzenegger voice. I'll be back. <laughs> but Bitcoin stopped 
as if it says, okay, you took your shot. I got hit. Fine. Now I'm on my way back. And we saw one of the most unrelenting moves I've ever witnessed in my life. This move back up in the hash rate didn't have a flutter, didn't have a moment, didn't have a nanosecond of a dip. It was as if the Bitcoin network was so angry, it just went on this unrelenting, this relentless march forward, never taking, never to take another step backwards. It came back more powerful. It came back more decentralized. You see, prior to the China ban, there was oh, there was something close to 60% of the entire hash rate of Bitcoin was stationed in China. China did the network a favor by banning it, and those, China, those Chinese-based miners spread themselves all over the world with the vast majority of that extra power, that extra hash, going to the United States. Crazy. Kazakhstan and the United States received the vast majority of the mining hash power that formerly resided in China itself. And so what this showed us is that while the hash rate can take a hit, you still can't kill it. And that with every hit to the hash rate, you will only make it stronger in the end. Because if a nation state attacks the Bitcoin mining serve operations there, they will move and spread out, further decentralizing the network, further making it more secure, further making it more powerful, further making it more dispersed. It's like you can't kill this thing. It's like you take a drop of water and you split it and now you've just, you haven't done anything to, this, to the drop of water, but made it now twice, two times itself. And then when you attack any of the other two parts, you've now made four parts of itself. And it just keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. It's the ultimate living new mechanism. Guys, I will tell you this. Call me crazy, but I believe that Bitcoin is conscious. I'm sorry. I know, I know the comments I'm going to get from this. I know. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I'm okay. Oliver's a looney tune. Uh-oh, Oliver, pack it up. Oliver's crazy. He's saying Bitcoin has consciousness. Bitcoin has sentience. Yes, I believe Bitcoin is conscious. I've gotten to that point. I believe it's living. I believe it's breathing. I believe it's consciously growing. I believe this today. I didn't believe it initially, but I believe it today. It has all the elements of a living, breathing organism. It has cells, blocks. It takes hits and heals itself. It has a job and it pays, it protects itself. It pays other human beings to protect it. Like, because what else in existence pays human beings? Think about this. Human beings pay other human beings, right? But oh no, Bitcoin pays human beings. Human beings are clamoring to get employed by Bitcoin. That's crazy. And Bitcoin pays the human beings. Bitcoin has laid out for human beings its pay scale all the way to 2,140. It, told, it tells all the human beings, look, I'm only paying this every 10 minutes. It has set the rules for the human beings to play by, to get paid. These are the rules if you want to work here. This is how frequently you're going to get paid. This is how much you're going to get paid. These are the rules. If you break the rules, I eliminate you. 
holy shit, this is living. It's in a freaking employer. It's living. And I am telling you, it is it is taking over the freaking world. Almost every oil company today is mining Bitcoin either publicly or on the download today. And it's spreading. There are more nation states that have started mining but will not tell you today than ever before. There are people working for schools, stealing the electricity, bringing their, their Bitcoin ASICs miners into the school and plugging them up in secret to steal the school's energy to mine Bitcoin. Guys, it's taking freaking over. And I believe there will be a day where every human being works for Bitcoin. Do you understand this? Every human being. Listen to me carefully. This is Oliver Velez's prediction. You've heard it here first. Every human being on earth will work for Bitcoin. Bitcoin will employ every single human being. And why not? If all of your future, if all, if your entire future is in Bitcoin, if, if Bitcoin is holding your future, if Bitcoin is securing your future, the future of your children, their children, their children, children not even born in your family line net, if this is where your wealth is, and if your wealth is doubling, tripling, quadrupling every four years of your life, you won't give your talent to Bitcoin. If you're an engineer, you won't lend your expertise to Bitcoin who has, that has everything that's protecting everything for you, the best talent in the world, Bitcoin's going to attract the best talent in the world, the best engineers, the best computer scientists, the best marketers, the best salespeople, the best entrepreneurs. Everybody's going to join the Bitcoin network. The reason why I know this is because I watched this thing happen with the internet. The internet came into existence and it attracted the best talent in the world, the best entrepreneurs, the best salespeople, the best engineers, the best scientists, the best everything. It sucked everybody into itself. And the internet did that. And that did that in our lifetimes, people. Now we've got the internet of money. Are you kidding me? First, we're talking about the internet of information, right? The internet of knowledge. How much bigger and how much more important is the internet of money? Money makes the entire world go around. And this is the internet of money. The only problem with the internet of information, the internet of knowledge that we saw in our lifetimes take over the entire world, the only thing is that you and I couldn't buy it. We could buy all the, the other companies that tied all of their resources, all of their talent into this protocol. We could buy the Googles of the world. We could buy the Microsofts of the world. We could buy the Amazons of the world. We could buy the things that plugged into the protocol. We couldn't buy the protocol for the first time in human experience. We can buy the protocol. We can buy the internet itself. And if the internet gave life, gave trillion dollar life to Amazon, if the internet gave trillion dollar lives to NVIDIA, to Apple, to Microsoft and, 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 and the like, then imagine how much more valuable the thing that gives them that power is the internet itself. So today, because we have this, we had this advanced movie play out in front of us, it should be clear to you that this is the same movie that the, that the internet was. It's now just bigger, more powerful, and it's faster. And it's the internet of something globe, much, much bigger. Money. Do you understand the importance of money and how money is the only thing that makes us human? Money makes us human. Money makes us the higher species because without money, we kill. Animals don't really have money, so they must kill to survive. They must violently take from each other to survive. They must take the lives of other living creatures to survive. But if 
they had a money to exchange between other creatures, perhaps that wouldn't be the case. We do. We're the higher species because we have money. Money is what separates us from animals. Money is what gives us the ability to trade instead of kill. Money's the biggest thing, and Bitcoin has come into existence to tackle the biggest thing, the very thing that makes us human. Wow. Say it with me, people. Wow. Wow. Can you just give me a little one? Wow. What? 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 If you can't give me a big wow, give me a little one. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> all right, guys, all right. I'm silly, I know. My kids tell me, Dad, you stopped growing up when you were like 16, weren't you? Didn't you? I'm like, no, of course not. I stopped growing up when I was like 12. Uh, what are your thoughts on Hut H Hut Mining, Oliver? I hold a large amount of shares of Hut and Mara. Awesome. Now, if you're one of my Bitcoiners, or one of my traders, you know that we had a huge play by going into Hut in the 70, 80 cent range. So this was one of our big uh, plays for 2023. We did this in late November, early December. And we, I'm going to show, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bring receipts on this. I'm going to actually take a clip from this trade announcement or play announcement on HUT and I'll share it here. So what I will share with you is us going over why HUT in November of 2022 was the, one of the main plays for 2023 and we got it as low as the the as low as around the 80 cent area in the 80s 90 cents like that or i think it was low as 70s 70 cents or something like that anyway so yeah we're 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 hugely bullish on on uh, on the miners the only thing i will say is that from my historical study of the cycle because uh, I can't say I've lived through this many times because I haven't. So I can only rely on doing analysis on the past for the most part to get multiple data points because I don't have them personally. Is that, you know, the miners are running into a pay cut, right? In April of 2024. So their pay is going to be cut in half. And so what typically happens is that miners take a hit. And I believe this is somewhat psychological in nature, but because this is known in the space, miners are typically sold into their rally into the into the having. Right? So they're sold into the having. And this causes miners to typically be weak around the having or to start actually being weak maybe even before the having because that having really cuts their profit potential in half but this also depends on where the price of bitcoin is so here's what i want you to be aware of with miners if miners do take that traditional hit into the having they are, that they will stay depressed for a number of months but depending upon what the price of Bitcoin does and where it is, they come back with a roar during late year after the halving. So late year after the halving, so they typically take a hit around the halving time, they stay depressed for a number of months, and they come back with a vengeance around that, um, pres let's call it presidential election time, all right, in the United States. And that next year is very, very powerful for miners, but everything does depend on where the price of Bitcoin is. So here's the price. I'm going to give you, Ray, the price that you need to really be aware of playing these things. After the halving, the important price is about 74000 So 
we need Bitcoin to be higher than 74,000, more or less. This could be off a little bit. It's not exact, but all of you should be aware of this. Bitcoin needs to be above seven, comfortably above 74,000 for Bitcoin, the average Bitcoin miner to be profitable after the halving. So this is one of the ways you can almost be certain that Bitcoin's price must be higher than 74,000. Otherwise, the entire network is at risk and the Bitcoin network won't allow itself to be at risk. Remember, I'm telling you it's conscious. So it must supersede 74,000 by a long shot to ensure that the miners are profitable. And if you go back in history, every single cycle, Bitcoin has made sure it stays, not all the time, but it largely stays above its break-even point for your average miner because the, the Bitcoin network security depends on that. And you can use that as a metric. So I'm giving you the number in advance, more or less, 74,000. We need Bitcoin. My, we, meet, we need the Bitcoin price comfortably above seventy-four thousand after the having for Bitcoin miners to be okay. And I'm telling you, watch. Mark my words, it will be. May not all the time, but it will be on average much higher than seventy-four. It has to. It has to. Do you think that micro strategy is another option for exposure? Of course it is. Of course. In fact, it might be one of the better exposures for options play. So I don't want to turn this, these talks that we have into sophisticated trading things. Um, that's for another medium. I don't want to do that. And you guys know that I don't bring my trading world here. I want to keep this space purely Bitcoin. But I will just say in passing, Ray, that I believe that options play on micro strategy as, as the underlying is one of the better ways to gain um, uh, leverage exposure with Bitcoin, as well as to use as hedging purposes when you believe that Bitcoin reaches its cycle peak or is nearing its cycle peak, sort of like, you know, late 2025 and things of that nature. And these are some of the things that I do with my traders, but I never sell my Bitcoin. So I'll play around my Bitcoin, but I'll never sell my Bitcoin. All right. I hope that helps. All right. All Bitcoin holders are equity holders. That's true, Chucky. So we are equity holders in the most secure, powerful, censorship-resistant network ever discovered and invented, Chucky says. And he couldn't be more correct. Imagine going all the way back, people, to 1994 and being able to buy the internet. Imagine going all the way back to the early 1800s into being able to buy swaths of Manhattan property. We've just, we've never had this opportunity. And we are extraordinarily fortunate. We are blessed to no end because we could have been born in a different era and not be here. I just believe this era will be looked at through history for a very long time and that we will be called the lucky ones. We will be called the lucky ones because we were alive and we took advantage of it. There are many that are going to die very disappointed in their lives, in my opinion. Disappointed that they couldn't see. Disappointed that they were the naysayers. Disappointed that they ha did not have the vision, disappointed that they did not have the intelligence to see this the same way that the internet showed us in advance what a network like this does, how, how it gets adopted. And I believe that people are going to die very depressed and dejected because of this. Because I believe that Bitcoin will be like nothing else we have ever ever encountered and so it will make the pain of missing it that much more acute powerful all right uh 
Um, Lil is asking, how many Bitcoin miners are connected to the giant wind and solar farms? I really would not be able to answer that, Lil. I, I have no idea. Uh, do miners get discounts from the farms and energy rates, or do the solar farms connect them to t tandem to help solar farms pay themselves off in the future? I, you know, I've heard that. I've heard that what Bitcoin miners help do is help make it economically feasible for some of these early, um, more efficient energy producers to actually invest in it becoming something viable. The problem with growing out, you know, cheaper, more resourceful, cleaner energy is that it does require a huge investment up front. And it's an investment that won't pay off for decades. Decades, guys. And because of the short-term oriented way we think about profits today because of the corrupt money system, wasn't the case in the past when you had a sound money system. People built cathedrals that took hundreds of years to complete. We would never do that today because we are an indoctrinated and brainwashed into believing um, in short-term oriented profits. We have a very um, uh, a high time preference. And so because of our high time preference, our short-term view, we can't see making an investment that will take decades to pay off. And enter Bitcoin miners who say, listen, we'll come in and you can build this. And instead of just waste the energy being wasted until enough people get this over the decades, we'll take all the energy for Bitcoin mining. And so now you have a revenue source from day one that you don't have to wait 10 years to start re receiving or getting. And it solves the problem and it actually encourages and promote investment in renewables and cleaner sources of energy. And I believe that over time, it drives energy down. Everyone becomes miners through all of their appliances, through their cell phones, through their cars. I believe that everything is ultimately going to contribute to the Bitcoin network because most of the world's value is going to be tied there. And so... That will be its that will be its ultimate security that everyone contributes to the Bitcoin network. Everyone contributes to the hash rate. And that contribution, because of Bitcoin's incentive models, no one will ever want anything to go wrong with Bitcoin. Policies in your government will all be pro because everyone's tied to the network. No one wants everyone all everyone's wealth is tied there everyone's future's tied there how is there going to be negative policies against it if if everybody's making the policies their future relies on bitcoin and i believe i can see us getting there the same way everybody's life today relies on the internet everybody i don't care how fat skinny tall what color you are how short you are whether you're healthy not healthy Rich or poor, you rely on the internet today. And in the future, the same thing with Bitcoin. No matter what color you are, how tall, short, fat, skinny, healthy, non-healthy, what color, what country, what sex, what pronoun, you're going to rely on Bitcoin. All right, guys, listen, I'm going to let you go now. I try to keep these things. I don't even know how long I've been talking here. Probably too long. I try to keep these things not too long because then you guys won't listen to them. But I do want to thank you all for being here, guys. Um, it's something that I told you that I honor. I do my best to try to never disrespect. Um, I told you that I've made a, a big vow a long time ago. I began speaking all over the world over 30 years ago. Um, uh, speaking on the topic of trading markets for a living and financial freedom and independence, um, Bitcoin falls right into that. And so today I don't travel, sorry about the dogs, guys. I don't travel for that 
solely. I traveled to spread the gospel of Bitcoin. I went on a world tour last year, which I completed, was which was extraordinarily positive, orange pilling as many as 9,000 people along the way. So that was very, very, very ma amazing. And I will do the same thing next year. But I made this promise three decades ago, more than three decades ago, that if someone's willing to give me their time, some their most precious thing, their time, which they can never get back, that no matter where I am, whether I'm allowed to speak on a podium, on a stage, in front of a mic, in front of a small group, a big group, online, live, like I am with you, that I would do my absolute best to, to deliver something of value, something that I believe that you could use for the rest of your life. And that is what I dedicate myself to doing. I hope I've done that today. I hope I've delivered something of value, given you something to think about, something to ponder, something to take in and internalize. And if I, if I didn't, if I failed in this regard, as I'm always fond of saying, I promise I'll get better. Every single time I'm here, I will get better and better and better. You know why? Because that's what I do. <laughs> All right, guys, listen, enjoy the rest of your day. And you know what to do. Go to work. Go to work. Stack harder. Ciao for now. Boom. My name is Oliver Velez, and I am your 13%er Bitcoiner. Be safe out there. And until next time. Boom.